اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وجفرجا So I just want to make sure that the mic is working. Inshallah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa maulana abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الوقت من لساني يفقه قولي. So dear brothers and sisters, welcome back to another good life session, <coughs> and it's an absolute pleasure to be addressing you believers in person. Now, what happens is that there's several important events that we need to cover, and we don't have enough time to cover all of them. Some of them I'll only mention briefly, but it doesn't mean that they lack in importance. It's just the time limits that we have and the importance of these different events. So the first one, and the reason why we're all gathered here tonight, is this is the one-year anniversary of the martyrdom of Shaheed. Qasim Sulaimani and Shaheed Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis and those who were with him and with them. There were many great souls who were with them. And just because we remember those two as being so outstanding doesn't mean that we've neglected how important those other individuals who were with them, who lost their lives, um, we don't, it's not that we've forgotten them. And this martyrdom was carried out at the direct order of President Donald Trump. This part's very important. So that's one of the events that we need to commemorate. Number two is that this is also, it happens to be around the time of the 40th for another martyr, Shaheed Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, another martyr who was martyred again by terrorists. And his life was also, he went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the 40th of this individual, so we want to remember him as well. Um, and also, we here at the Hadi Institute, we didn't get a chance to perform our responsibility to mourn and commemorate the passing of Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi. He was a unique personality. And I want to mention just a little bit about him. Again, this is, none of us is going to do justice to those souls and what they've done for Islam. <clears throat> The other one is also that I feel I need to address at least briefly is that a movie was made by Sheikh Yasser al-Habib. It was called The Lady of Heaven. So we need to talk a little bit about that movie as well. And then finally, we all witnessed just the other day the chaos on Capitol Hill. So I think it will be good to spend a few moments also talking about that and what that means for us as well. But first, I need you to send a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, <clears throat> what happened, we'll start with, again, this isn't the necessary, the order of importance, we just, we'll cover them each, inshallah. We'll start with Capitol Hill. What happened on Capitol Hill? So for you brothers and sisters, obviously that wasn't a surprise. What happened over there, this was the natural culmination of a Trump presidency and his enablers. This actually, some people were so shocked, how can this happen in America? For the African American community, black people like myself actually, nothing has changed. I want to just put, point out one of the lessons, and then after that, what I, happens is if we don't analyze this properly, I am afraid that even for us as believers, we might not see how this was actually a shot in the arm for the empire. If it's not analyzed properly, if we don't understand what just happened, that this actually helps them. And I want to talk a little bit about that. It was an inside job. 
Inshallah, let's get there slowly. But first of all, one important, undeniable reality that you and I were watching, were witnessing is institutionalized racism in America. You and I all know if black people like me had even thought about storming Capitol Hill, what would have happened? If we even wanted to gather out there, what would have happened? You know that we would have faced the brunt and the brutality of the police state. It would have been legendary how they would have dealt with African Americans. And even though this is something which is hard for some people to grasp, some people, it's literally difficult for them to be, that there, there are two Americas. How some people are treated under the law is very, very different. In interaction with a police officer, you can be in your bedroom and the police can have a no-lock warrant like Breonna Taylor. Or you can be selling cigarettes and be choked on the street on camera, and nothing happened. You don't even have to be a police officer. You can be having Skittles in your pocket, and a vigilante can kill you without any fear of retribution. You're going to see very shortly, because you already saw what happened to the cops with Breonna Taylor, right? But like, very short, and, and now Blake, right? Blake, Jacob Blake shot seven times because what happens is, so interesting, the police officers, when the police officers and the security, when the people went over there, and by the way, you and I, we're not calling for the police to say they should have shot those people. Not at all. It's just the idea of how unequal it is. How the police officers, when those other people are there, they're taking selfies with them. They're helping the elderly, because all of them weren't young. They're helping the elderly down the stairs. They're finding a way to treat them with kid gloves because you don't want to kill people, right? That's a good thing. You don't want to kill people. But with other people, you can shoot them seven times in the back and not even blink your eye. Just now, these officers, now with George Floyd, I mean, somebody can have their, their knee on your neck for seven minutes, kill you in front of everybody, and you're going to see, inshallah, not inshallah, <laughs> but they're going to be, they're going to get on with their lives. It's going to be okay. Right? So this idea that institutionalized racism doesn't exist somehow, there's not two ways of treating people, no, 100%, 100%. But what happens is institutionalized racism is so much bigger and more devastating than just police brutality. That's also something that would be a mistake to trivialize this and say that, oh, well, it's just, if we could just reform the police department, then things would be okay. Part of the reason that African Americans, that there's such a disparity in the wealth of African Americans are direct policies of the federal housing administration. They've made, they made, you can look this up later, just so you can see, where they would make policies where loans would be given for people to develop suburban homes and sell them at a cheap price. But the condition was that African Americans not be allowed to purchase those homes. You couldn't resell those homes to African Americans. And then naturally, there was a disparity of wealth. Once you get a house, once you get equity, once your children are able to get um, finances, there's a natural way. By the way, this got worse under Obama. So I don't want anybody to think, you know, before we get there that, you know, oh, all we need is a black person. No, no, no. I'm just trying to explain a little bit about what happens. Education, or even another thing that's really sad is right now, you and I, we all see the, how black people are excelling in sports. We'll have these people who, subhanAllah, they can run, they can jump, the things that they can do. I wonder if we ever think about why it is that black people are overrepresented in sports and entertainment. 
When you only have one way out, and you're living in a desperate situation, and you have millions of people trying, isn't it natural that you have superstars to then continue the same process of oppression? Do you know how many athletes, student athletes, whose careers are ended early because they, told, they, they lost their ACL or some other accident? How many people go through this system, are robbed of any chance of a college education to make big money for universities so that 200 can get make it? And then, well, yeah, they're superstars. This is so much greater than just the idea of this kind of inequality. Um, and I also, I mean, there's so many examples, but I think you guys, you can go over, because you're trying to prepare the world for the coming of the Imam. And you know, and I'm gonna mention the Hadith, that racism is just one of the evil fruit of the system of Fir'aun. And you can't solve this problem. You're not expecting as a believer, well now, Joe Biden is there, Kamala Harris is there. Things are gonna be different. The system is, what is Islam's solution? This is also important for us to keep in mind. Once Malcolm X, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was addressing an issue or an incident of police brutality. And he explained, he said that you've got to go deeper. You've got to address the root. You don't just address a symptom. What's the cause of this? What's the cause? This is one of the policies of a system which is based on non-divine rule. I'll mention one of the verses of the Quran about this, and then after that, let's talk a little bit about the solution, right? Surah 28, verse number four. Inna Fir'aun, the system of Fir'aun, not just that one person. Inna Fir'aun, truly Pharaoh, ala fil he was arrogant in the land. He divided the people into groups. This is something that the system does for its own interest. Yes, one group was selected for punishment and mistreatment. For instance, here in America, the black people suffer more from racism. So racism affects other people, by the way. But those who, get, who catch it, or the African American community. But no ma this is important now. No matter who becomes president, no matter how woke or liberal they are, that's not going to solve this problem or the rest of the problems of America. The Islamic solution, Malcolm X said this, if you see towards the end of his life, the solution in America, he taught us, was Islam. We don't want to get all worked up about this and, not, and want to only fix this. What's the pro this is one of the fruit of this evil tree. The Ahlul Bayt have taught us a hadith from Imam Sadiq. He says this, Nahnu aslul khair. We are the root of all goodness. Wa furu'uhu ta'atullah. The branches are the obedience of Allah. The other good things, equality, justice, being equal under the law, opportunity, those are all good things. But where does it start? The wilaya of the wali of Allah, what you're working for with the coming of Imam Mahdi. The wilaya of the non divine leader. It starts there. The branches are the other. Racism is one of those branches, one of the fruit. So you and I, we're not one of those people who's just waiting for Kamala Harris. Finally, alhamdulillah, they did the, the, the electoral count, and now Kamala Harris and Joe Biden are here, so now everything's going to be safe. What was Kamala Harris like as an attorney general? I mean, Biden said before that if there was no Israel, we would need to create Israel. 
We've seen black faces in high places. We've seen Obama. Do you guys remember? I don't know how many of you remember this. Do you remember those ranchers who took over federal lands and were treated with kid gloves? Did that happen under Trump? Even if we're saying we're going to fight institutionalized racism, we need a Democrat, let alone the rest of the world. I don't think for the rest of the world it really matters where bombs are they being dropped from a plane that is by people who are Democrats, the military machine is Democrats, or is it Republicans? So that's a little bit about that. Now, I mentioned a little bit that this was an inside job, meaning for us to not get really, really carried away. Okay? President Trump tweeted and told people about the rally. It's not like the National Guard didn't know. It's not like the police didn't know. They knew what was going to happen. He spoke for an hour to his people. He had told them to be wild. They didn't call in the police. They didn't call in the National Guard. They let them in. When it was African Americans, then when the shooting starts, the looting starts, the shooting starts. With these guys, be wild. It's going to be a magical day. Two Americas. But is the solution a democratic president? If Sleepy Joe is here, then inshallah everything will be fine. The same person who has expressed for you what his views are. This idea, well, no, okay, if it's not him, AOC. No, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is actually a shot in the arm for the empire. There are some people who next election will be so frantic, to, they will consider it their moral obligation to vote for a Democrat because we can't have Trump back. There's some people who are going to be like that. There's some people on the Trump side who are going to be like, well, they stole the vote. We got to get in there. So what the empire needs is that people believe that the elections matter. They need people at the, the box. Yes, it was a shame for America. He did cut at the root of the trust of the people of the electoral system. I mean, the same people who are now elected Joe Biden they also elected the Republicans. They elected him last time. They're working in the ballot box. Yes, it is a shame for America. It is hurting the prestige of America. But don't think that this, if it's not understood, that the only way is the kingdom of God on the earth, that this is going to hurt the empire. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. So also, last point is that you and I, although there is no comparison between Muslims and the racism in America, there is racism amongst Muslims. There is racism amongst Muslims, unfortunately. And it shows itself in many ways. Sometimes how we treat other Muslims from other ethnic backgrounds is something that needs to be corrected. Marriage, if that comes up, sometimes how our African-American sisters, brothers and sisters, are treated if they come to massage it. Sometimes I find even amongst Muslims, those who are of darker complexion, amongst the same race or the same ethnic group. So this really needs to be addressed. But of course, there's no comparison between that and the colonializers and those people whose minds have been colonialized and need to wake up to what Islam says. But it just needs to be addressed. Now, very quickly, I want to move on to Shaheed Mohsen Fakhri Zadeh. Shaheed Mohsen Fakhri Zadeh was a leading academic. Now, to me, he is an example for all of us, especially those of us who have the blessing or have been blessed with secular education. Some of us have been blessed with the blessing of secular education. Is there a responsibility in a way for us to contribute to the cause? Yes. Who are our role models? People like Shaheed Fakhrizadeh. What Islam teaches us is this. 
Al is from Amir al Mu'mineen. It's quoted by, uh, from Amir al Mu'mineen. Al ilmu sultanun. Knowledge is power. Man wajadahu salabih. Whoever finds knowledge dominates through it. Wa man lam yajidhu sila alayh. Those who don't have knowledge are dominated. So for our young Muslim brothers and sisters who have that opportunity to get secular education with the goals of Imam Mahdi in mind and serving the cause, these individuals can turn that knowledge into something that gives Islam power. In so many fields, if I stay true to my Islamic values, and that blessing that I've been granted doesn't change me. You know one of the challenges? One of the challenges is this. If a Muslim who's been blessed with secular education gets their values from Western humanities instead of Ahlul Bayt, my sense of right and wrong, if I'm a ritualistic Muslim or a cultural Muslim, Sometimes what happens is a person, their foundation are not Qur'an and Sunnah. I've learned other things. I went to other schools. I've learned Western values. Without being aware of it, I've accepted those into what is right and wrong. There will be times when I will tell, somebody's trying to do their Islamic responsibility. Don't judge. Where'd you get that from? In Islam, we have Amr bin Ma'ruf, we have Nayyina Munkar. What is Islam's stance on homosexuality? We've got, you can't be a homophobe. What is it? There's so many areas where Islam has something to say. Is Islam, what, I get that secular education, but what Islam says is the truth. Once there was a very young brother, a teenager, a teenager at that time, and he was in a situation where he was going to a Roman Catholic school. And he was a strong brother. He wasn't one to be intimidated. I'm going to a school, everybody else is Christian, I'm a Muslim. He was asking me, he was, it was even loud for me to go. The brother was asking. The thing about this brother was that his value, this was, he was a young brother. I used to see him with his Quran, and he would have his Quran highlighted. He would be, <laughs> when he would give advice, he was younger than some of his siblings. He would be the one giving Quranic advice because he, if you read Quran when you're young, it becomes part of your, we're told in hadith, your blood, your flesh. That was his identity. This other, I, well, I know what they say about the Trinity, but it doesn't mean that that's my belief. I've accepted that. Any of this nonsense is true. Very important for us. But otherwise, if we accept those Western, we'll never be able to serve Islam like Shahid Fakhr al Now, the next one that I want to talk just a little bit about is the movie, The, the Lady of Heaven. Okay. And I think this is important for you and I to make sure that we've understood thoroughly. Um, some people are just really asking, you know, is it halal to watch? Is it okay? You know, what are the, the, I haven't seen anything from my marja. Is that a problem? Right? That means I really, I haven't learned to connect the dots. I don't know what's at play. Why? I want to ask them some questions just for us to start thinking about, right? Why in the time when at the end of the Trump administration, there is so much pressure on Muslim nations to normalize ties with a Zionist entity, why at this time release the movie? Why it is important that Sheikh Yasser al-Habib control the narrative on such a sensitive issue like the Shahada of Lady Fatima. Who is Sheikh Yasser Al Habib? Why would the UK pressure the Amir of Kuwait to release him early? They have this idea of Al Af. Right? That happens that sometimes they release, but why was he pressured? Not even to allow the cycle to go to. Why do you immediately you have to get him out? Why does he need to be in England? What's so important about this individual? Now, brothers and sisters, 
I want us, even, even think about this, right? You see how, how sensitive right now Twitter is, right? If you say hate speech, right? Ofcom in England, why does he have a platform? Is hate speech very dangerous? Why him? Now this one, brothers and sisters, I want us to practice connecting the dots. I don't want to make a conclusion for us. I want us to think about some things. Allah says this about some of the enemies of Islam in Quran. Okay, so you can look this up later. Surah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Surah 47 and verse number 30. What does God say? Why doesn't God make it easy? Sometimes you have to connect the dots. What does God say? God says this. If we wanted to, we would have showed you who they were. My glasses aren't. Yeah. After that, you would have known them by their mark if we told you. If we wanted to, we would have quickly shown you who these guys were. But what else does God say? If you pay attention to their words, you'll know who they are. God doesn't make it easy. You as a mu'min, you have to connect the dots. Some clues now. Imam Khomeini, may Allah have mercy on his soul, taught us that those who attack marja'iyya, there's some people in the time of Imam Khomeini, they would attack maraja. Maybe even on behalf of Imam Khomeini, these marjas are like this. They attack marja'iyya. Imam Khomeini was so upset when he heard this. He said, that the, he explained to us, those who attack marja'iyya, are out of the wilaya of Allah. Out of the wilaya of Allah. What does Shaykh Yasser al-Habib say about Ayatollah Sistan? These are things you can look up. It's not, oh, the Shaykh said it, it must be right. No, no. Some of you know Arabic. What did Shaykh Yasser al-Habib say about Ayatollah Sistani? You know, in America, we have this saying that you don't speak ill of the dead. Some people are so angry at Maraja. Even Maraja who are among the Marhumi, what did he have to say about Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr? I mean, like, he passed. What does he say about Ayatollah Bahshat Marhum? So that's just one clue. What does this man say about the symbols of resistance? Because you and I, we have no, no doubt of who Israel is and who Netanyahu is. Right? What does he say? We look at this up ourselves. About Qasim Soleimani. We're here to commemorate him, the whole world mourning, Shia, Sunni, Muslim, Christians. What does he say about him? What does he say about Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah? What does he say about Imam Khamenei? Just have to put the dots together. It's, it shouldn't be that difficult. It's not like that story they tell about this professor in Iran. They said there was this university professor. And so he asked his students, he said, um, what's the answer to such and such question? So one student stood up and he said, the answer is this. And he said, Barakallah. And then somebody else said, but what's up? This is the answer, the opposite of what he said. He said also, Barakallah. Then somebody stood up and he said, look, you said Barakallah Fikum to him and he gave you one answer. He gave you the opposite answer. You also said Barakallah Fikum. He said, you also Barakallah Fikum. It shouldn't be that hard to connect the dots. Also, when it comes to insulting any of the wives of the Prophet, because you know the fatwa of your maraja. Your marja, what have they said about insulting the figures of our Sunni brothers and sisters? What have they said? You know, what are, you know this is the naib of the imam. Sometimes what happens is the maraja give you a little bit of the wisdom 
behind why they're making their ruling. Just a little bit of it. You know one of the reasons why it's intolerable for him to insult Ummul Mu'mini? Because whoever insults any of the wives of the Prophet is insulting Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. How would you feel if someone dared in your face to say the worst things about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa If someone thinks they're clever and that you as one of the Shia of Amir al-Mu'mineen, you're so backwards, I can pull this off in front of you, right in front of you, and say it to your face. We're not about rewriting history. In the Battle of Jama, this is for us to just see, after the Battle of Jama, how did Imam Ali, Imam Ali wasn't afraid of anybody, how did he treat Umm al-Mu'mineen? The deference, what did he do? Only because of Rasulullah. So somebody has this much hatred for Rasulullah. They're making a film about his daughter. This person is either one of two things. A paid agent of Israel and the Western powers. Or no, worse than that, when you're an unpaid chump who does the bidding of these enemies. Let me read you a hadith. This, our prophet, he says this, Ya Ali, our prophet talking to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Sharrun nas man ba'a akhiratahu bidunyah. The worst person on the face of the earth is the one who sells his akhirah for the dunya. وَشَرٌ مِنْ ذَلِكَ Worse than that person. مَنْ بَاءَ آخِرَتَهُ بِدُنْيَا غَيْرِهِ Worse than that person is the person who sells his akhirah for the dunya of someone else. I'm not even getting the money. Why did they take this talented individual out of prison? What did he do? Now, one of the things about this individual is that you and I know how thirsty he is for blood of little children. Now, by the way, just so you know how terrible that is, someone who, said, who even says half a shatra kalama, half a word, and it causes the blood of a believer to be shed will be raised on the day of judgment and it will be written on their forehead that they have no hope in the mercy of Allah. So now this individual who's so thirsty for the blood of Shia, Sunni, Christians, because ISIS, what were they doing? What was the excuse? There's something else that you brothers may have noticed before. In Pakistan, they would have targeted killings. Right? So you are an alam who's calling for unity. We have to kill you. Why do we kill you? You, uh, you curse the Sahaba. You are a doctor. You are a lawyer. Why do we kill you? You curse the Sahaba. What was interesting, though, is that in Pakistan, they wouldn't kill the one who was cursing the Sahaba. He'd stay alive. They're killing you. Why? Because in your heart of hearts, you're cursing. They keep them alive. His protection was so strong over there. He had to tell them to back up. It was just so obvious. Ya Sir al-Habib. So now this person who's thirsty, because you and I, have any of us, you saw what just happened in Kuwait, right? Kuwait, Pakistan, those shuhada that we lost. I don't know how many of us are aware of this. Or what happened in Iraq, do you remember? There's videos, I mean, and if you have the heart to see these videos, where there's a camp in Iraq called Camp Spiker. 
1,700 young cadets were taken out. And if you listen to the Arabic of the video as they're blowing the brains out of some of these young men, they're saying this is because of Ummul Mu'mini Aisha. Those insults that happen, now I'm blowing the brains out of these people. So someone who's like this, who is stoked, who's because there's no excuse for what they're doing, and no normal Muslim would do this, but the person who's stoking this to give them the excuse, you know, there's another video you can see. Sheikh Al-Ar'awr, the Wahhabi. He says, no one has done khidmah to Islam like Sheikh Yasser Al-Habib, including myself, including many Wahhabi preachers who are much greater than I. And he mentions this on TV. That no one has served us like Sheikh Yasser Al-Habib. So this person who wants to see little boys and girls slaughtered, who enjoys that, and his make, if Netanyahu made a movie about Lady Fatima, how, is it jaiz, should we see it, is it good? The enemies of Islam. We also need to talk, and my time is coming to an end because the main talk was about the shohada, but let me see if I can go through this a little bit more quickly. The sad demise of Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, may Allah have mercy, on his soul. If you, and we don't have time for it now, but if you could see the praise of Allah Matabatabai for this individual, Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Marhum Mishkini, Ayatollah Jawadi saying that may I be sacrificed for Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, um, Ayatollah Madahiri, like these individuals, what did they say about Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi? And Imam Khamenei saying that he's a brother, that he filled the, the place of Alama Tabatabai, of Shaheen Mutahari, this kind of an individual. And some of, there's so many lessons to learn from this individual, someone who became a mujtahid at such an early age, but didn't take the path of marja'iyya, instead worked on fixing and explaining to people the Islamic perspective on many issues which affected their life. For instance, just one example, the humanities, Western humanities. What is the Islamic stance on that? Who's the person who did the work on that? So much service to Islam as far as teaching and studying and creating those people who would be able to serve the ummah. And he himself, although he has the status of someone who's at the level of marja'iyya, would sacrifice his name and his integrity. He used to go, Marhum Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi, before the Salatul Jumu'ah in Tehran, and he would go over and speak. And people came, to, ulama, came to him that you at this status, you send your students. Because you should see what they did to him in Iran. The way the enemy did character assassination of Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi was incredible. Anyone who knew I, how gentle he is, how fair he is, but how was he painted in the average mind of university students and regular mu'mineen who had no idea of the status of Ayatollah Misbah and how he was in his akhlaq and his humility. But he was always someone, what does Islam need? He's older than Ayatollah Khamenei. We've seen the videos of him. He says, this is the wali. He's teaching us, how do you deal with the wali? When he was, the leader said, because he used to be part of the Council of Guardians, the leader said that being on the Council of Guardians does nothing for Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi. It adds weight to the Council of Guardians. This kind of an individual, at that level of quality, and there's no way I can summarize so who he was as far as his knowledge, and then taqwa, and then his relationship, the spiritually, how he benefited from Allah Matawatabai, from, from Ayatollah Bahjat himself. Who was this man? And then how he refused to defend himself and defend his name and everything was just Islam. Brothers and sisters, that's even harder sometimes than going on a battlefield is to take the criticism. People talking you, mocking you. When you're elderly, now you're supposed to be venerable. Anyhow, may Allah have mercy on his stage. I have to. And you are with me, inshallah, and you're going to show this, inshallah, with the salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, that we commemorate the shahada of this great shaheed who was martyred at the orders of Donald Trump. Salawat, please. Oh.
So, because we don't have time, and yet it's so important, remember that what we've been taught is when we hold these gatherings and we remember the shohada and their story and why they're here and why they sacrifice themselves, this is a continuation of that shahada. You and I, we didn't have the tawfiq to be there defending our shrines, defending our brothers and sisters in Iraq, defending the madlumin. How can we continue that effort that those brothers, they did, and they were on the ground? These were, I'm sure many of you are now seeing the stories that are coming out about who these individuals were. Who was Shaheed Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis? Who was Shaheed Qasim Sulaimani? There's videos where the soldiers who fought along these men, in their old age, they tell the stories. How Qasim Sulaimani, for instance, may Allah have mercy on his soul, how he would always go to the front line. He would be standing and we were on the ground trying to avoid the bullets. His generals, this is from... You know, the, he was part of the Quds force in Iran. He went to the front line. There's so many under him. He didn't want his generals to be afraid. He would go to the front lines and put himself in harm's way. They talk about his akhlaq, his humility, how free he was, how direct he was when it came to explaining the position of the wali. What did these two do to unify the nation of Iraq and Iran and the Muslims all over the world. When you see Christians, and this is available for those of you who can speak the Arabic language, Christians talking about how, what Daesh would have done if it wasn't for Shahid Qasim Sulaiman to Christians. Someone who cared so much about humanity. How would he help the Palestinians? What did he do? This man who at that advanced age was doing these unbelievable, I mean, I was just literally, in Iran they were commemorating some of his activities. And it's interesting to see the video footage of what this man did. One of them I was watching recently was showing when he, there was a town in Iraq called Amirli. And Amirli was surrounded on all sides. It was about 30,000 of our Shia inside there, surrounded, cut off. Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah protect him, and all of our maraja had given the fatwa for jihad, but there was no way to get to rescue those individuals in Amirli. So they're surrounded on all sides. Daesh, and remember Daesh and how they came in the videos, and you've seen and slaughtering, cutting off the heads, and these Shia were going to resist till the last drop of their blood. They show the video where the helicopter of Qasim Sulaiman is flying in the air and Daesh are shooting at him. Like if you look at the video footage, it says Daesh cameras. <laughs> to land inside, when you're Qasim Sulaimani, the whole world wants to get you. Land inside, on the front lines. Organize the believers. Fight your way out from inside. And how many missions like this? You've seen the videos where Shaheed Qasim, Shaheed, Allah give him long life. Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah was saying, he was saying, I was offering prayer. Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah, may Allah protect him. He says, the thought crossed my mind that maybe the angel of death would come to take my soul. He said, I thought to myself, if it had to be, Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah says this, if it had to be me or Qasim Sulaimani, I would say that the angel of death come and take my soul and not Qasim Sulaimani. And then the humility that was there between them, someone like Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis with that senior position, that gray beard, and he says, I am a soldier of Qasim Sulaimani. The humility. The way these individuals interacted with one another, no ego, everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each one more willing to sacrifice himself for the other. May they all be raised with the Ahlul Bayt. And may this, their martyrdom, be a way for people to learn who really made Daesh. Who created them? Who supported them? Why is it that Daesh didn't fire even one bullet at Israel. 
so willing to kill, slaughter, eat livers of individuals. Why not Israel? Who made them? Who supported them? Who provided the logistics for them? And then after that, who gave the order to kill the man who was destroying Daesh? May Allah use his martyrdom as a way, a way of us waking up and developing basira. Inshallah, Allah hasten the reappearance of the imam of the time. May Allah accept what was said and heard in his way. May Allah make us take from the bravery of these shuhada so that we're able to fight against our own nafs. And also when we're given tests, that we don't panic, we don't falter, but rather we learn to be true Husseiniyin. Inshallah, we end with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.